Good morning and welcome to Necton Submarine STEM 2020. Wonderful to have you all with us. My name's Jamie and I'll be your host for today. And we've got a fantastic live lesson coming up with Sheena, uh, who's dialing in all the way from the Seychelles and talking to us about the relationship between submarine exploration and the conservation of our ocean. So really looking forward to, to that coming up in just a few minutes. Before we start, a wonderful welcome uh, to all those of you who are watching. Uh, we have uh, young people probably at home now in Australia, the UK, the USA, Panama, the United Arab Emirates, Switzerland, India and the Ukraine. So welcome, one and all. Wonderful to have you with us. And we can see a few of you coming up on the live chat already. And we have a special shout out um, that's been sent through already. We've got a shout out to all the pupils from Mary Tavy and Brenta Primary School in Tavistock. So wonderful to have you all with us, um, probably from home now. And great to have you as part of this submarine conservation live lesson. So just to give you a little breakdown of what this is going to entail, if you haven't joined before, uh, these live lessons supported by Inmarsat. So a wonderful shout out to all the wonderful folk there for this support. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to have a wonderful presentation uh, by uh, Sheena, and that's going to be about 15, 20 minutes. And then we are going to go into a Q&A section. Now for the Q&A section, if you haven't submitted your questions already, the way to do that is via the live chat on YouTube. You will need a YouTube account to do this, so make sure that's done by a responsible adult, parent, carer. Um, we are not suggesting that young people create their own YouTube account. If you are having issues, remember that we have our teacher moderators on board. There is a live chat help button on the Encounter EDU website. So if you need some help, just get on there and have a chat. And they can also post across any questions that you may have. It is a live lesson. So on the live chat, do remember to keep your comments and questions to the kind you might have in a real classroom. So looking forward to this immensely. And I'm just going to see if we can get uh, contact with Sheena all the way over in the Seychelles. Good morning, Sheena. Good morning. Wonderful Hi, to guys. have you with us. I, I think you've got a, pre a presentation for us all about deep sea science. And, and we've been hearing all these wonderful talks this week about how you explore the deep ocean. But I'm really looking forward to hearing about how all that work can go into protecting our wonderful ocean. So I'll hand over to you and look for, forward to hearing more. Great, Jamie. I'm really excited to be talking about this. Um, uh, so thanks, Jamie, for the introduction. Um, and for those of you who don't know where the Seychelles is, it's a group of islands in the Indian Ocean. So very far from a lot of you, especially those calling in from the USA. Um, and before we start off, I'd really love to tell you a little bit about me and why I'm a scientist. Um, so my love for science and especially marine environments um, started when I was really young. And it started off firstly because I loved animals, like I'm sure a lot of you do. So I especially loved animals that I'm not used to seeing in the Seychelles, like wolves and bears, anything furry. In fact, at my house, I have seven dogs. Um, so it was quite strange. <laughs> um, and my other love was outer space. It was so interesting how there's like this completely different world out there that we knew nothing about. But I didn't realize that there was another world that we know very little about right at our doorsteps, especially for me who um, grew up on a small island state. And I only realized the importance of the ocean when I first started diving. I was about 17 then. At the time, I didn't realize I could find this poorly explored expanse underwater. 
And when you're underwater, some of you may be divers or snorkelers um, or go to an aquarium. It's really awesome that you get to see all these different types of fish. And as you go deeper in the water, you get to see fish that you won't see at most aquariums, like deep sea sharks or deep sea corals. And the best thing for me is like when you're floating underwater is to see all these fish that come right next to you, like they're not afraid. But why am I telling you all of this? Because um, it's not just fun to go down in a submarine to learn about the ocean. It's really, really important um, for three main reasons that I'm going to run through. So the first one is data collection. When we go down into the sea in submarines or using ROVs, which is remotely operated vehicles, they're like little robots. We go down there to collect data. Now, if you look at the earth, you'll notice that most of it is actually ocean. So there's um, more than 70% of the whole world is actually water. But only very few countries have the possibility to go down into the deepest parts of the sea to explore what's there. Um, and you use really cool equipment to do that. Like I'm sure you guys have heard all about this week, like submersibles that some submersibles can go down to 11,000 meters. Um, or ROVs, which are remotely operated vehicles, which can go down and pick up samples that you will never see um, at very shallow depths. Being able to see this underwater world firsthand, um, like for example, in this picture, you see the mapping of the seabed. So you can see an underwater mountain. This is very, very strange for someone who lives on land and is so used to seeing just mountains. But it's also important to go down into the deep to see what other creatures live there, like very deep sea corals. What's interesting for me is how things change from the very top at 10 meters, where you can usually go snorkeling or diving, all the way down into the depths of the sea to about 250 meters or even deeper. So at 10 meters, there's lots of light. And you can see lots of different structures, lots of fish swimming around. And this you will see when you go snorkeling as well. But then at like 30 to 60 meters, it kind of changes. You don't see as much light and there isn't as many hard structures anymore. This is like fan corals and lots of little fish just swimming around. And as you go even further down, the light decreases. There's not as much light anymore. This is about 120 meters. And you can see that the corals become wispy. And to go down to these depths, you can't just dive down. You have to be very specialized to dive to 120 meters. So we use um, submersibles and ROVs to go down and collect data using video cameras. And down at 250 meters and even lower, the life seems to get, the light seems to get even less. And all you can see are like sea urchins and very slow moving animals and a lot less food. And you see all these little structures and crevices. And it's really important that we go down and see what's there so that we can make informed decisions when we make um, decisions about where to protect. So in the Seychelles, um, our oceans are really important because it gives us food, it attracts tourists to the islands. Um, and being able to collect this data helps government make really important decisions, like whether certain areas in the oceans should be protected 
and we shouldn't allow fishing to happen in certain areas. A great example of this is as of yesterday, the Seychelles decided that 30% of our waters will be protected. This is a long project they've been working on for a very long time. And it's something that the whole world is working towards. And this was decided based on all the science that have been inputted by different scientists from around the world on our oceans. The other really important thing for me to um, link science and inform conservation is getting people to think of our deep sea like it is our backyard. So there's this really cool project um, that they're doing in the Atlantic and Pacific Ocean where they use cameras to go down to 6,000 meters and then they show everyone what they found to get people interested in what lives in our deep sea, our backyard. Because a lot of people can't actually swim. So I live on an island, like I said, and um, a lot of my friends can't swim um, fully. So they, it's not easy for everyone to go down into the sea. So using submersibles like this one, or bringing images to people's TVs really enables them to link with the ocean. <coughs> So there we go. This was my first time in a, in a submersible. And behind me, there's a manta ray. I was so busy taking notes that I didn't even see the manta ray behind me. And there was lots of fish. This is at around 60 meters. And the little thing that you see in the side is, a ha is like a, a manipulator that can pick up samples. So that if we see any rare samples at depths, we can collect them and identify what they are. As you can see here, the manipulator arm is taking a sample of a coral and putting it in the basket. We bring it up to the surface and then we do a whole bunch of tests so that we can see whether it's a new species. And all the video footage that we collect from this goes to all to the countries where we work in. So for example, all this footage went to the government of the Seychelles and they can show it in schools so that the children can also learn from our experiences. I think it's really important to try and get people to link with the ocean, especially when you show them cute pictures of like, the Dumbo um, octopus, which you find at very deep, uh, a very deep depth. Um, it kind of makes it uh, more relatable. So you need to get people to relate to the ocean for them to protect it. But you also need to inform people of what is there and why it's important. Otherwise, um, there won't be a reason for people to want to protect our oceans. And the very last but very important point about this is local knowledge. So growing up surrounded by water, some of us might only learn how to swim when we're very old, a lot older, but our other um, different generations that have different types of knowledge. So some of the, our grandparents have knowledge about the ocean because they've gone fishing for a long time. So they'll know where there's aggregating sites of sharks, for example, or when um, different types of fish breed. Uh, and this is really important to get all that knowledge together so that we can communicate that to our governments and scientists so that they can make decisions on where we need to protect. One of the other really important things is linking up with scientists, especially locally and nationally and internationally. So pictures I have are um, different people that I've met uh, during my time working with Necton on the vessel. 
from Seychelles and Maldives. And all of these people are doing extremely important work um, to conserve our oceans, whether it's looking at um, tracking turtles or doing fishery, fishery plans to make sure that fishing is done as sustainably as possible, or whether it's protecting a whole island. It's really important that all these great minds come together and work together. Because the more people we have for the ocean and working on the ocean, the better. So I think one of the highlights for me of being able to go into a submersible um, is the experience you get from being inside a submersible and being able to tell that story to other people. Because although the ocean isn't accessible for everyone, um, using equipment like ROVs and submersibles and bringing um, cameras and footage back into classrooms really informs <clears throat> the general public and makes everyone care about the ocean um, and the importance of conserving it. Amazing. Thank you so much. Um, Sheena, that was incredible to hear about your journey into <laughs> conservation. And I think that th there's a number of questions that are coming up to, this, to, to put, put this in, in, in the broader context. You mentioned the, the fantastic news that uh, the Seychelles is um, promising to protect 30% uh, of, of its ocean. One of the, the, the first questions that came up is this really the basic one. What does conservation actually mean? That's a very good question. So conservation, um, depending on who you ask, may have different meanings. But in the Seychelles, it means everyone comes to the table, especially for protecting the 30% of our waters. Everyone comes to the table, all the partners, all our governments, and we decide that there are certain areas, areas that are really important and are unique. So we need to make sure that humans don't extract fish, for example, or do any deep sea mining or any destructive behavior within the, that area. So it's really protecting an area and making sure that we um, that we have an idea of, uh, that we control the kind of activities that happen in a certain area. And, and you mentioned, um, you know, how uh, it's amazing to connect people to the underwater world by going in, in this immersible. I think, I think you're in this one. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but but how how does the information, <coughs> and you talked a little bit about data, so knowing what's down there, how does that help, for instance, Seychelles government to do conservation in the right way? So um, in general, we've been talking about conservation and protecting things, but we can't protect what we don't know, right? So some of the very important questions that we ask when we go down in submersibles or we use ROVs or any kind of science that we do is what lives there, what kind of structures are there as in, for example, is it a flat area or are there mountains or are there caves? Um, because that might influence what kind of animals and um, plants we find in an area. So they're very basic questions, but these questions inform us as to the uniqueness of an area. And so when, when you're talking about doing conservation in a submarine, it's not like an underwater park ranger making sure everything is okay. It's really relating what is on the seabed so you know from the surface which areas boats shouldn't go and people shouldn't fish or, or do other sort of commercial activities. Exactly. So it's not like we, we go down and we have fun in the sub. Um, it's got a lot of um, implications. So for example, um, like I said, we need to answer very basic questions, um, but we also need to collect a, a lot of different types of information. So the submersible we use is the coolest part of the equipment, but we also use lots of other ones, such as nets, 
um, these really fine nets that we connect little animals that live in the surface of the water. Um, we also use uh, chemical data is also important. So for anyone who likes chemistry, you can also do marine science. Um, so it's a whole different um, types of data that you bring together and you work on with a lot of different scientists for sometimes over a year that will tell you um, whether an area requires protection, for example. And thank you so much. You know, those, those questions were driven by comments and questions from Camille and, and Oscar. This is uh, from Luca, who's, who's eight years old, who wants to know what does it feel like to be in one of these? <gasps> That's a great question, Luca. Um, so on the ship we were on, um, it was very, very noisy. And then when we got into the submersible, everything goes quiet. And it's like being in space. I don't know if you've watched any space movies, but sometimes you can, the only thing you can hear is like a toot, toot, like something like that. And that's what it sounds like because there's that communication between the submersible and the ship. And as you go down, it's just in this particular submersible, you can see lots and lots of fish. And the thing that surprised me the most is because the glass is so thick, the fish actually look very small. Um, and I thought they'd be bigger. Uh, yeah, so it's, it's a really nice experience. It's very small space. So you have to be happy in a very cramped area. Um, and it's... Yeah, it's an experience that you don't quite get. I mean, it's, a, it's absolutely incredible. I've got a quick question um, here through from, from Matthew, who, who's wondering, what is the rarest fish that you have seen, maybe either from the submersible or, or from scuba or snorkeling? The rarest fish that I've seen? Hmm, that is a good question. The rarest fish that I would like to see, maybe it's not that rare, is a mola mola or a sunfish, but um, probably I've seen a lot of um, scalloped head hammer, uh, scalloped hammerhead sharks, which are endangered species actually. So they're very important animals. Um, some places in the world see them more than others, but I would say that that's probably the my favorite species that I've seen. That is listed as critically endangered. Um, and and the, there's sort of lots of questions about sort of different forms of, of, of life, but there's also this question that I want, want to get to um, from Zane that came, came over um, the, the help chat, um, which is what areas have you explored and what one, what is the best, your favorite? <gasps> Oh, that's a great question. Actually, my favorite place, um, well, I have two. So my favorite place that I've explored um, in the Seychelles waters um, is a group of islands actually called Aldabra. So if you've got a pen, just write that down, Aldabra um, and Astove. Um, and the reason why is that Aldabra is a world heritage a UNESCO World Heritage Site, um, and it's had protection for a very long time. And swimming in its waters, I have never seen so many fish. There's just fish everywhere. It's like being on the Galapagos, for example. Um, the other place is Astor, because although Seychelles is taking the initiative of protecting 30% of our waters, a lot of corals have been affected around the world. And Seychelles is unfortunately one of those countries where corals are dying because of climate change. Um, and Astov had the most beautiful coral. We went to some places where all the coral was dead, but Astov had vibrant and beautifully colored corals. So those are my favorite two places. I think we've just seen on the screen a, a an image of coral bleaching, um, mm -hmm. which is which is obviously happening. I think there's another mass bleaching event currently happening yeah. on the Great Barrier Reef, and I know that we're probably all focused on different types of news, but not to forget the natural world during these extraordinary times. Definitely. 
Um, com coming back to uh, s some of the questions here is, is, is more on, on the submersible side of life. Mm -hmm. And I know that uh, the, 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 the submersibles that are going to be used in future expeditions are slightly different. Uh, but how deep can you go in these these submersibles? So in those submersibles, you can go to about 300 meters max. Um, there are other ones that you can go deeper in. Um, yeah, but these particular ones, it's about 250, 300 meters. And, and do you... <laughs> sorry, sorry, Jenna. Do you get any, did you get any strange sort of occurrences like the you know, underwater life thinks this is another big fish and starts following you around or that kind of thing? <laughs> yeah, actually, um, a lot of people had this, but when we were on Aldabra, that island I was talking about, um, we had a lot of potato groupers. So there are these fish, you saw them in some of the videos with all the spots. Um, they would just come and sit on the submersible or just stare at you the whole time. So it, it was a really interesting experience that they weren't um, disturbed by the fact that there was this huge, giant, um, you know, alien kind of submersible in their territories. And, and and sort of how, how I think we've got an image of, of a potato uh, grouper um, up now, but um, what? How long do you stay down in a in a submersible like this? Well, for these ones, because we were so like we said before, going down, it's not for like patrolling, right? We were doing um, we're collecting data, so the kind of data we were collecting was either video data, so we would go along a straight line for a period of time and just film whatever we uh, whatever was in that frame or we would go down and uh, collect samples well either corals or um, sponges or crustaceans or crabs and things like that um, so we could stay down for as long as two to three hours sometimes two or three hours and and yeah. you, 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 know, you, you've mentioned how wonderful it feels inside mm -hmm. the submersible this is a question from from Julian, wondering whether it was ever scary at all. Um, I think for most people, especially with this submersible, um, it's like being, it's like you're in a fishbowl, right? So it's like you're in a fishbowl and you can see everything around you. So it's not that scary um, because it doesn't feel like you're stuck in a cupboard. But there are submersibles such as um, the ones that go very, very deep down to full ocean depth um, that is that only have very small holes where you can look out of, um, and that's a little more claustrophobic. It, yeah, it would feel like you're stuck in a cupboard, um, and I imagine it would be a little more scary. I'm just going to go back to the, the the conservation side of things, and we've got a question through from the Ukraine, and and that's that's wondering, have you seen any practical results from the data that you collected, for instance, last year, and and the conservation efforts that are starting to be put in place? Wow, that's a great question. Um, so, a lot of the work to um, conserve, so to protect. 30% of Seychelles waters um, is based on research that was done a lot a long time ago and using models. Uh, that's a great thing about technology, right? Is if you don't have enough science, you can use models. Um, and sorry, Sheila, uh, just we've got a few younger um, oh, students watching. So if we just get into so models, is it making like, sort of gluing gluing bits of plastic together or making something? Ex uh, yeah, exactly. So it's like using a computer to kind of tell you where there's a lot of um, birds that come all together or, um, for example, where there's lots of fish. So you can use um, lots of different tools nowadays because um, technology is so advanced. Um, but a lot of this information, we need to make sure that we also have the science, the data that we collect using submersibles and using um, video cameras and nets. <clears throat> so the work that Necton did, um, that work will go into that process to make sure that it's ground truth, which means that um, the 
models. So the, the computer generated work also um, lines up with the, with the things that you see in the water. So. And, and just, just for, for, for those um, people who are watching, models you may have come across before with weather forecasts which are taking a lot of information exactly. about what we think is going to happen and saying, well, we think this is roughly what the weather is going to be like. It doesn't always work out that way. And so the more data we have, the better those predictions can get. Definitely. Um, and so I've got, I've got a lovely question uh, from username Candy Boy. Um, have you ever named a new coral? You're collecting new coral samples, collecting new species. Do you get to name them? So no, not necessarily all the corals we collect are new. Um, some might be new in the sense that it's the first time you collect it in the Seychelles waters or in the Maldives waters. Um, but people around the world may have collected the same sample. Um, but some may be new. But before we name anything, it has to go through a long process where you, you look at it under a microscope, you even um, do an x-ray of the, of the coral sample, for example. Um, and yeah, there's a lot that goes into it before you can say it's new to science. Um, but when it is new to science, the um, scientist that uh, described the sample is the one that gets to choose how um, how you get to name it. Do you, do you think you'll you'll ever get to, to to get involved a little bit of that? Do you think there's going to be a, a cropper geniensis in the future? <laughs> um, well, some I'm more of a fish kind of scientist, so I would love to name a fish one day. Um, but uh, all our colleagues. Um, generally work very, very closely with the governments to make sure that the governments who are our partners are also happy with how we name, um, for example. Brilliant. Um, from Andy, and, and I love this question too, is, is what's the strangest thing you have seen underwater? Uh, the strangest thing I've seen is a, um, it's a starfish, um, let me remember the name. I think it's called a basket sea star. So before I went down into a submersible, I had never seen a basket sea star before. And I thought it was a coral because it was just sitting there very mobile. Um, and then when you touch it, it kind of moves. So that's probably the strangest thing I've ever seen. But I would like to see a Dumbo um, octopus one day. They, they, I've seen seen photographs of them um, come through. I think um, NOAA, the American Oceanic exactly. and, and Atmospheric um, Organization, has got some great images that they've they've got from deep water cameras, and they mm -hmm. they really do look like a cross between an octopus and um, mm -hmm. and an underwater elephant. Um, but a question that came through a little bit earlier, this is from Camille, and it's an, it's an interesting one because it sort of brings up probably quite a lot of sub-questions. Mm -hmm. But the question was, do you get plants that glow in the water? And I suppose it brings up some, some interesting words such as phosphorescence and bioluminescence that perhaps you can, you can describe to the young people watching. Yeah, so... Um... You also get uh, fish that glow in the water. Um, so I don't know if you know this, but because there isn't a lot of light very deep in the water, um, some of them kind of make their own, um, such as the anglerfish, which kind of has a light at the end to attract um, food to it so that it can um, eat very deep. I mean, there's no light there, so it's difficult. But um, like you said, there is two different words we use, uh, bioluminescence. Um, it's the production of light. So you sometimes find that jellyfish can also have that. Um, so they 
produce a kind of chemical. Um, and then you also get the other one, which is phosphorescence. Um, and that happens in some animals, um, and that's without combustion of heat. Uh, that's a very, they're quite, yeah, they're quite different words, um, but different organisms will use different ones. And I can remember on the Indian Ocean coast in Oman, when I was on a, on a, doing work there, that all you saw the algae in the waves glowing as the waves crashed onto the beach. So, it, uh -huh. it, so uh, algae are, are sort of small plant-like living things in, in, in yes. the ocean. And, and, and I think, do, do they glow? I think some will, um, not all of them. So uh, also, like I was saying with zooplankton, so zooplanktons are really small um, animals that live in the surface of the water or in different areas of the water. And some of them will um, create light or create that illumination. Um, but like you said, there is there are certain places where you'll find that there's the phosphorescence, like you said, um, where you see it at light. Um, where organisms in the surface of the sea will sort of light up. And you do see that sometimes in the shallow waters in some areas. Amazing. And, and uh, this is a really interesting question that has that come up, which is sort of related to, to, to the wider um, piece that we're, we're looking at. Um, and, and it's about corals and, and some, some basic coral biology. Okay. Is if they're, they're sort of stuck in one place, for the most part, unless they're a mushroom coral. Uh, but how, do, if you're stuck in one place as an animal, how do you get your food? That's a very good question. So corals, like a lot of you know, are actually animals, right? So they have, um, so, and, yeah, so a lot of corals are actually animals. Um, and they feed by opening up these like little tentacles and they collect things in the water column. And that's how they feed. And, and do, do, I think uh, we, we, we covered sort of coral bleaching uh, earlier and that, that gives us a clue that, the, that there's some shallower coral that have a, uh, a turbocharged trick up their sleeves. <laughs> yeah, so definitely um, a lot of, the corals that are being bleached, some of uh, that sunlight, they need sunlight, obviously, um, but sometimes when it gets really hot, those little animals will die um, and it will leave just the white part of the coral, which is the like bone structure. Um, it's just a type of calcium. Um, and that's why it's bleached because it's white and Basically, the zoanthalae, which is what we call them, the little animals that live on that structure, have died. So, so we've got these, these some, some catch their uh, food using the tentacles, a bit like a jellyfish yeah. or an anemone. And then we've got those <laughs> shallower corals that can actually make energy from sunlight exactly. through a small organism inside their tissue. Yeah. I mean, that's absolutely amazing, Gina. Thank you. Um, but a lovely question I've got through from Arian, um, who would like to know who or what inspired you? I know you, you mentioned your love of wildlife and your love of space before, but was there a special person who inspired you in, into this career? <laughs> yeah, that's a good question, actually. So, like I said, I always liked animals. Um, my parents were also always keen on teaching us about animals and, um, I lived in Kenya for a while, which means I got to see big wild cats, like lions and things like that. Um, and then living here in the Seychelles, um, there were some really great teachers. Teachers are always the people that inspire me the most, I find. Um, so the teachers really pushed and encouraged me to um, do marine biology because I like to swim and snorkel. 
Um, and yeah, they pointed me in the right direction. And one of the fish that really inspired me to be a marine biologist is the coelacanth. I don't know if you've heard of a coelacanth, but it's this really prehistoric fish that they thought was um, dead and no longer in existence like the dinosaur. Um, and then they discovered it off the coast of South Africa and then in the Comores. So it's this amazing fish that lives in the very deep ocean, sometimes over 300 meters deep, um, that inspired me to be a, a fish scientist, really. Amazing. We've got, got, got one great question to just, just come up, but Matthew's asking more about uh, the photosynthesis and, and corals. And what we'll do, Matthew, is we've got some more information on the website and we'll get a link to that put onto the live, yeah. live chat for you. Um, but this is from uh, Candy Boy, uh, again, who would love to know, are there any areas that you haven't explored that you would like to explore? Oh, there's lots of areas that I haven't explored. Um, I would love to go into every ocean um, and, yeah, and just explore as much of the ocean as possible so that not only for myself, but also to bring back that information to people, for example, here in the Seychelles and people who live in the Indian Ocean. Um, this area of the world hasn't had a lot of research done in its waters at all. So the more people we get interested in doing marine science, then the more biologists we'll have um, that can contribute to conservation, uh, to protecting um, the world around us. Um, Sheila, well, we've got we, this is uh, lovely, but we're going to go to some 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 funny questions coming through now. Cool. Um, so, this is a question, which is, if it gets a bit smelly inside the submersible, is there anything you can do to get rid of the smell, or do you just have to wait for a few minutes, for a few hours? You just have you just have to wait. Maybe hold your nose. Um, that might help, <laughs> but apart from that, there's nothing else you can do. <laughs> nothing else. Be very you can do. angry at the person sing, sitting next to you. <laughs> so you maybe sort of jab the person sitting next to you. Yeah, uh, and tell them not to eat beans the night before. Or something okay, like that. so so that's top tip if you're an aquanaut or a submarine explorer. No beans the the day before you get into a submersible. Excellent tip mm -hmm. there. Um, Andy would like to know. Um, what happens if, if you get a shark attacking the submersible? Is it strong enough to withstand that kind of thing going on? Um, yeah, so the, these submersibles are built to withstand pressure. So pressure is, so as you go down into the sea, the kind of the heaviness that weighs on the submarine gets more and more as you go deeper, right? So they're built to be very, very, very strong. Um, I haven't encountered a shark attacking the submarine submersible yet. Um, and um, to be honest, most of the sharks we've seen just like swim right past us. They don't even worry that we're there. Uh, and Shia, what's the biggest biggest shark you've seen either in the submersible or while you've been uh, scuba diving? Um, biggest shark I've seen is a... Probably um, because I generally sh shallow dive, um, I've seen a lot of black tip reef sharks, which can get up to about 1.4 meters, sometimes a bit bigger. Um, probably a thresher shark, which we saw in a submersible, which is a really cool shark uh, and not very commonly seen but it looked very small when we were in a submersible because of that very thick glass. So it looked like a toy, but we know for a fact that it was quite big. It looked, it looked like a toy shark, shark but is it in, in fact massive big. Very, very sadly, uh, Sheila, I, I think we are running out of time, unless we could just do a very, very quick fire um, round of, of just a couple of questions. Your favorite ocean and why? Favorite ocean, Indian Ocean, because I'm from here and there's so much work we can do in the Indian Ocean that hasn't been done yet. Uh, deepest part of the ocean? Um, Mariana Trench. <laughs> Excellent. Um, and uh, 
three things you do to stay safe in a submersible? Well, you always listen to the instructions of the um, pilot. You pay attention all the time. Um, you are the other eyes of the pilot when you're in the submersible. Sheena, amazing. Thank you so, so much for being part of Necton Submarine STEM 2020. It's been great to have you with us uh, all the way from the Seychelles. Um, and thank you also so much for all those great questions coming in and to all of you who are watching at home. Um, if you are looking for more live lessons, we do have several next week. So do look on Encounter EDU forward slash live to see the upcoming lessons and we Sheila you're coming back for us this afternoon mm -hmm. um, so that our North American um, audience can tune in and also anyone else in the UK so if you enjoy this do spread the word uh, and get more people to listen to the fantastic Sheena um, this afternoon it's been wonderful to have you with us Sheena thank you uh, Thanks, and Jamie. for the moment it's a uh, bye bye thank you so much bye 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 <laughs>